We're pleased today to have two experts here to talk about summer readiness, including contingencies for the shutdown of San Onofre, what we're going to be doing this summer. Obviously, this is going to affect all of us. We're going to have both of their presentations, then we'll open it up for questions and comments from the regional council. Our first presentation is from Veronica Gutierrez. She's the Vice President of Local Government Affairs for Southern California Edison. She's responsible for all community and government relations at the municipal and county levels. I'm sure most of you know her or the number of employees she has working around. Prior to her current role, she was Vice President of Corporate Communications, responsible for all SCE communications. She was Director of Public Affairs for Edison International. We're very pleased to have you with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Vice President Pettis, and thank you, Hassan, as well, the regional council members. I'm here today with Dennis Peters with the California Independent System Operator to talk about an update on SOMS and its implications for the system. And I have to tell you, Dennis and I were sitting here as we were waiting to speak. We were very impressed by the attendance here. Your dedication to your municipalities and the region on July 5th is quite admirable. Thank you for the work that you are doing. So I'm going to be providing just an update on where we are. This is not about restarting SOMS. This is really about SOMS being out, out of service, and its implications for the region overall. So the presentation that I'm giving here today is essentially what was given to the NRC a couple of weeks ago. And one thing I cannot emphasize enough is that our overriding interest is the health and safety of the public and our employees. So San Onofre will remain shut down until repairs have been made and until we and the NRC are satisfied that it is safe to operate. Obviously, we're disappointed that the situation has occurred, and I'll get into some of the details on it. And we recognize the impact that it has on the region overall. So this is a very appropriate forum for this discussion in that regard. We understand the significance of the unexpected tube-to-tube wear that we experienced. And that is part of why not only the NRC, but experts from around the world have convened to try to figure out exactly what can and cannot happen with respect to these units. Early on, we recognized the seriousness of the situation. And as a result of the complex technical nature of the wear, we recognized that we needed to assemble the very best team. And I'll get into that in a little bit. But we have experts from Arriva, Westinghouse, BMW Canada, and others who are working not to verify our own findings, but to challenge them. That is really critical here. In the nuclear culture, it's unlike any other in that regard. This is not a matter of reviewing someone else's work and just giving a blank signature. It really is to challenge us to make sure that we are doing the best. The nuclear culture is a learning culture. So the idea of having everyone out there to view what is happening, to analyze it, is really critical, not just for us at SOMS, but for the industry overall. And I'd like to just talk a little bit about where we are with the units themselves. On January 9th, Unit 2 was shut down for refueling. This is typical of what happens with a nuclear generator. You end up shutting it down to change out the fuel, and that's the normal process that you go through. Unit 2 was shut down on January 9th. On January 31st, Unit 3 experienced a leak, a small leak in one of the nearly 10,000 tubes in the generator. And when that happened, the operators detected the leak. It's very sophisticated equipment. The amount of the leak is akin to what's in your smoke detector at home. So it was very, very minute, but the systems, the detection systems in the generator are very, very sensitive. They made the decision to shut down the unit. And as a result, we also made the decision to not start up Unit 2 until we had a good handle on what was happening in Unit 3. And because we wanted to make sure that we understood it, we still have both units out. I'll get into a little bit more about where we are now with Unit 2. The operator's prompt action in this regard basically means that the system worked. This is what's supposed to happen if you have this type of incident. The concern here, obviously, is that these are new units. So we take very seriously the fact that this is happening in new units. It's not supposed to happen. So we want to make sure that we get to the bottom of it, obviously, and so does the industry and the NRC as a whole. 
Uh, to explain very quickly what is going on here. We have a simple diagram up here that shows the steam generator. It shows the, um, the primary uh, system and the secondary system. Uh, the primary plant is the large one with the red and blue steam generators there, the reactors down in the middle. The secondary plant system is outside of the, of the oval, if you will, there. Um, and it's where the steam goes and it turns a turbine to create electricity. Um, so what happens is that the steam generator is essentially a large heat exchanger. It's kind of like your your, um, um, so your radiator in, in your car. Cars have radiators. Um, so it's a primary heat um, um, system that circulates hot water through those tubes initially. And I'll get more into those tubes in a little bit. But there are 9,727 tubes in each steam generator where they transfer the heat to another system that essentially heats the water that ends up going out to the steam generator. So you do not have radioactive water going out to the steam generator. It all stays in that contained system. If you see the bottom where the uh, below the steam generators, there's a loop. The water comes in one way and comes back out. And then the other water is the one that goes out to the steam, um, uh, to the turbine generator um, off, on, off to the side. Uh, so what occurred on January 31st was a very small leak in one of those tubes um, in one of those units. This um, diagram will give you an idea of what those, uh, the inside of that steam generator looks like. You see that, uh, that upside down U-shape structure. That is where the tubes are. That is where the nearly 10,000 tubes exist. And people ask sometimes, well, how big are these tubes? My finger fits in one of those tubes. So it gives you an idea of how, of how small those are. And what happens is the water pumps up one side of it, comes back down the other, and recirculates. It heats up through at the reactor level below. So what happened here was that you had tube to tube um, wear, where you had some um, vibration. And the tubes themselves are 65 feet uh, in length. Up above, where you have that curve, that's called the, the, U, the U structure. And at the U structure is where we had uh, the U bend, is where you had the unusual wear, what we consider to be um, unusual wear. That wear um, is not supposed to happen where you have tube to tube um, uh, contact, and that's caused the wear because of the vibration that uh, that occurred there. The um, the actual um, uh, system is supposed to work so that the water goes through and it heats it up. And you expect some vibration in some instances, but not the kind that touches, that has the tubes touching each other. Um, in this case, you have, if you look at the bottom of the tube uh, um, structure, it almost looks like a honeycomb. That's how close the tubes are to each other, but even then, they're not supposed to touch. So what happened in unit three is that you had the tubes touching at that U-bend structure. So obviously there was something wrong there. As a result, we ended up plugging, this is what we say, um, you take a tube out of service, you plug it. Uh, you leave it in place, but you plug it so that no water is running through it anymore. Um, and we ended up plugging uh, 326 of the tubes. Um, there were um, eight tubes, I believe, that had experienced the wear, but there were others that were similarly situated in the structure, so we didn't want to have any risk, obviously. There's no tolerance for for any kind of risk here, so we wanted to make sure that we plug the number of tubes that could be similarly affected. <coughs> the, the wear is in fact localized, um, and in unit two, it doesn't um, appear to have the same type of uh, a phenomenon happening. Uh, we have two tubes there that were uh, required to, to be plugged, uh, again, um, uh, as a preventative uh, measure. And we have now run 60,000 tests on these tubes and we're going to continue to run them. We're, we're, we're the stage that we are um, at right now is one where we are reviewing everything with these experts that I mentioned um, earlier. The, the team uh, the teams from Westinghouse, uh, NPR Associates, uh, Arriva, BMW, and EPRI. EPRI is the uh, Electric Power um, Resource Institute. These are all experts that are there, again, to challenge us to make sure that we are doing uh, the right thing because the the, the learning culture and the peer um, review culture within the nuclear industry is something that goes well beyond just our facility. It really is an industry-wide uh, culture. And what they're looking at now is what they found, essentially, is that what it caused the, the, uh, the, the vibration is something called fluid elastic instability, which essentially means that what we had was a condition 
that was discovered back in the 70s that could exist. And so we have the experts who wrote about it even back then participating among this group of experts. But essentially what happens is that there is excessive vibration that's causing the adjacent tubes to move above and below each other and make contact. And this is what thins the tubes up in that localized region. So what we're trying to figure out is, okay, is there anything else that we need to look out for now? We believe we've identified all of the tubes, but is there anything else that we need to look out for now? We know that in Unit 2 we did not have the same situation. In Unit 2 we were ready to go back on, but we wanted to make sure that we understood the cause. And now that we know the cause, we're going to run more tests still on Unit 3. I can't tell you when that one's going to come back online. We really don't know. And I do have to tell you that our primary focus here, again, is on safety. The augmented inspection team that came out from the NRC made recommendations. They provided a report two weeks ago. We agreed with the report. We are developing additional information that's required of us for the NRC in response to what's called a confirmatory action letter, which outlines all of the steps that need to be taken before any restart is even possible. And we're going to continue to develop the intermediate and long-term solutions. At this time, we believe that Unit 2 can be prepared to come back online, but we can only give a target date, and that is not until the end of the summer. Again, that's only a target date. It's not a fixed date, so that date can slip as well. For Unit 3, we don't know if that's going to happen at the end of the year or beyond. And there were a lot of questions early on about the schedule. Why does it keep moving? Well, the primary reason for that, essentially, is that there is no timeline on safety. We really wanted to make sure that we had a good understanding of what was going on here, and we actually tried to delay the start even longer in terms of how we characterized it because we wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to look at this. What happens in the CAISO, however, is that there's a date that you have to plug into the system so that people can plan around it with other resources. We actually joked early on and tried to see if we could do a December 31, 2099 start date, the end of the century, just so that people know that there is no fixed date. There really isn't. But we had to give target dates that were within the year, closer in line. However, again, those can move as well. Again, safety is our priority. We cannot have any of these systems coming back online until we are satisfied that it is safe to do so and the NRC is satisfied that it is safe to do so, and that is our primary focus. So knowing that neither unit is going to be up by the end of the summer, possibly even longer, there are implications to all of your constituents because we serve all of them, almost all of them, within Southern California. There is a special need in South Orange County and in San Diego, obviously, because of the location of the plant, and that is what Dennis Peters will speak about now with respect to that overall implication for you and your constituents. And after he speaks, we'll take some questions. Thank you.